In 1995, Rare started work on an absolute masterpiece of a game for the anxiously awaited new home console from Nintendo, and in doing so, changed the course of gaming for decades to come. But most importantly for this channel, gave us one of the most killer soundtracks ever conceived. That's right, we're talking about GoldenEye. Ian Fleming created James Bond in 1953, with the first film adaptation appearing less than a decade later, featuring Sean Connery. Bond. James Bond. The character came at a time in the mid-century when Britain was finally coming to terms with its troublesome history of going into other countries, meddling in local affairs, destabilizing the system of authority, and imposing British culture. So it was refreshing to have a hero to look up to, who would go into other countries, meddle in local affairs, destabilize a system of authority, and impose British culture. All commentary aside, James Bond was exactly the type of suave, confident, and capable character that the West wanted at the height of the Cold War, and it's no surprise that he went on to become one of the most, if not the most, recognizable action hero of the 20th century. The original James Bond theme was written by Monty Norman for the 1962 film Dr. No, and described by fellow composer David Arnold as cocky, swaggering, confident, dark, dangerous, suggestive, sexy, unstoppable, just like the character. And like the character, even its most basic motives are immediately recognizable. Probably the primary motif that we associate with Bond is this half-step climb from scale degree 5 to 6 and back again. And it's the first thing we hear in the theme following the fanfare. The second motif we recognize is this sequence of notes, Do, Re, Do, Me. usually played by the guitar in this rhythm. The main melody is this leaping ascent to T with a half-step resolution to Te. But the swagger comes from this raised four Fi leading to So. We'll get into how Rare, and specifically Graham Norgate, turned this iconic theme into a soundtrack, but first I need to rave about the game for a minute. In 1996, first-person shooters were one of the main reasons to get a PC for gaming, with early 90s releases like Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Star Wars Dark Forces. Rare was given the bid by Nintendo to work on a Bond game for their upcoming Nintendo 64, but when Rare began development in 1995, they were still a little unsure as to what the hardware capacity of the 64 would be. To cover their bases, they planned for two versions of the game, free roaming, like Doom and Wolfenstein, or rail shooter, like Virtua Cop and Time Crisis. Once they realized the capabilities of a Nintendo 64, they opted to blend these two versions, using the controller's joystick and directional C buttons for free movement and Y axis looking, and the R button to initiate a rail-based aiming mode, where movement was limited but the player could aim anywhere on the screen and thus the console-based shooter genre was born. Not only did the game give more freedom of movement and aiming to the players, but it also offered a stealth-based approach to combat, with the option to look around corners, move while crouched, shoot through windows, and disable cameras and alarms from a distance. And that's not even getting into the multiplayer that was added at the last minute that redefined the genre altogether, edging out Mario Kart for best multiplayer game on the system, a far cry from the shoot 'em ups of Doom and Wolfenstein, GoldenEye 64 laid the groundwork that later franchises like Halo, Call of Duty, and Splinter Cell would all build on. But back to the music, because GoldenEye's soundtrack goes hard. From the moment you turn the game on, the classic theme has been remixed in an electronic rock style. Each of the game's 20 levels has its own unique track based on the thematic elements of the Bond theme we mentioned earlier. And while I would love to make a 3 hour video diving into every single one of them, 
and why the electronic sounds in the silo level emulate the computers working on the satellite, or how the temporary shift to relative major in the Severnaya surface level makes the drop back into minor that much more cold and desperate, or how the rhythm track on the train gives a sense of speeding down the rails, or how the absolute brilliance of having no music at all in the jungle level until the Xenia fight is perfect... I'm not going to. But quick shout out to the elevator music. In this video, I'm going to focus on just one of the many brilliant tracks, The Cradle Level. The Cradle Level is the last story level of the game, with the two secret levels being unrelated to the plot of Goldeneye. And that being said, I am going to very quickly summarize the story here, so spoilers, I guess, if you can call it spoilers for a 27-year-old spy film. Okay, here we go. Goldeneye opens in 1986 with Bond on a mission in the Soviet Union to infiltrate a chemical weapons plant with fellow agent Alec Trevelyan, 006. Bond successfully destroys the plant, but not before Trevelyan is caught and executed by Colonel Oromov, the Soviet commander in charge of the facility. Nine years later, Bond attempts to prevent Xenia Onatop, a member of the Janus Crime Syndicate, from stealing a stealth helicopter. He fails so that the plot may continue, and discovers that same helicopter at a facility in Severnaya just before a massive EMP blast knocks out everything in the area. Bond investigates, learning that the blast came from the GoldenEye satellite under the control of the Janus Crime Syndicate, but probably with access from now General Oromov. Bond uses his network of contacts to arrange a meeting with the Crime Syndicate, where he learns that his old friend Alec Trevelyan, instead of being dead, is actually Janus. Bond escapes, of course, and tracks Trevelyan and the GoldenEye Control Center to a submerged satellite dish in the jungles of Cuba. With the help of computer hacker Natalia Semenova, they shut down the satellite controls, but Trevelyan attempts to manually send a command to fire on London from the antenna cradle itself. Bond chases Trevelyan around the cradle to their final showdown. This level in the game is intense. It isn't terribly hard on the easiest difficulty setting, but absolutely brutal on the harder settings. It features an infinite amount of armored guards, each dual wielding deadly 9mm ZMGs. The player must disable the firing mechanism, then chase Trevelyan, doing as much damage as possible while being shot at from all sides. After hitting him enough, he will taunt Bond, finish the job James, if you can, at which point the player must follow him down a ladder to a tiny platform and desperately try not to fall off before shooting Alec one last time. The intensity of the level is evident in the track from the get-go. We hear this discordant augmented triad suspended, like the antenna, above a tick-tock percussion, reminding the player that time is of the essence here. The build-up starts with a low bass voice interjecting short bursts, ending on the lowered fifth scale degree. This lowered scale degree 5 is important for a couple reasons. First, it keeps things from ever sounding resolved, because so is a stable scale degree, but we never make it there. Second, this track uses the minor mode, but this pitch isn't a part of it. So not only are we not resolving to so, but we're being left on a note that doesn't even belong in the scale. Also, this note wasn't arbitrarily chosen. It's the swagger note from the main James Bond theme, the chromatic pitch leading to so, though, as we just saw, it doesn't here. This buildup is extended bit by bit until it chains together this one and a half beat long pattern over one and a half bars until it becomes the driving bass of the main track. After one four-bar cycle, the rock drum starts in, with mostly offbeats, still building intensity. It all leads up to here, where the melody begins, and I'll tell you, I am a sucker for this sort of long note melody over a fast-driving bass pattern, 10 out of 10 every time. While this rising three-note pattern may sound like it's going to be the Force theme from Star Wars, It's actually a reorganization of the primary motif of the original Bond theme, skipping over the second go in favor of a stepwise ascent. The second time it skips up to fa, then puts it all together, climbing stepwise up all the way to, yep, there it is again, the raised fourth leading to so. This melody repeats, doubled at the octave, building more intensity this time by adding in dissonance to the last two notes of the ascent. Mm -hmm. 
Now, how do you ramp up intensity after increasing the drum beat, doubling your long note melody at the octave, and adding in dissonance? With a key change, of course. The bass pattern shifts up a whole step, while the melody becomes faster and more involved. Now it is much more recognizable as the guitar theme, but just in case you forgot that you are James Bond, here is their chromatic theme layered in underneath it. But why stop there, says Graham Norgate. Here at the end of the game, we are finally rewarded with the entire James Bond theme, the chromatic steps, the skipping third, and the classic leaping melody, almost as we would have heard it originally in 1962, albeit more rock-influenced than jazz. All this music is happening while you are chasing Trevelyan around the antenna, trying to get shots in while you can, all while avoiding his limitless supply of heavily armed guards. Once you hit that threshold, and he says his line taunting the player, the music changes, ramping up the intensity even more. The drum kit switches from a rock backbeat to a driving snare kick 16th rhythm, but it's the bass line that really handles the sense of urgency here. The track so far has given us a sense of being in a hurried 4 meter, but that gets obscured here. With straight 16th notes, the drum doesn't imply any particular meter, and the bass returns to the original pattern from the buildup, that 1.5 beat pattern over 1.5 measures. Because of the asymmetry of this pattern, we don't get the strong note on the downbeat, but more than that, the pattern starts over every 3 measures, while our ear has grown accustomed to 4 measure phrases. This ambiguity clears up when the chromatic step motif comes back in, repeating under the leaping theme until the end. As the urgency continues, we get these dissonant chords punctuating the texture, but this portion of the track isn't supposed to go on for very long. You're supposed to be in a hurry to beat Trevelyan, and the music encourages this in every way possible. If you're like me, GoldenEye 64 was an integral part of gaming growing up. But even if you weren't gaming in the 90s, you've probably enjoyed its posterity, with pretty much every major shooter now being able to trace its roots back to 1996 on the Nintendo 64. I've criticized Rare on this channel before, pretty justifiably, for their less than sensitive handling of other cultures and musical styles, but credit where credit is due, they knocked this game out of the park. Rick Astley lists it as his ultimate favorite game. There are obviously some weaknesses, character models are blocky and blurry, but charmingly based off of each member of development. The AI was sometimes clunky, but enemies would react in different ways depending on where they were shot and you can knock their hats off. And of course, the soundtrack is an exceptional example of how to take thematic elements and arrange them in numerous unique and exciting ways. I mean, is GoldenEye 64 a perfect game? Yes, yes it is. Fight me in the comments, subscribe for more content, and I'll see you next time.